Morning. You don't believe that these strategic reserve releases uh, will have any kind of medium or longer term structural rebalancing effect? No, absolutely not. I mean, obviously what it helps in the short run to make sure that the front end doesn't really rally away. So I think I have, I can see that, that obviously that's a little bit of a capping effect, but does it really change the fact, as Jeff was mentioning, basically um, investment is down quite a fair bit, 30 plus uh, percent, that's one factor. And if we look at the demand side and looking at air travel, well, that remains pretty robust. So we still think the demand side can hold up quite well. Then you have governments who basically ensure that, you know, the pain on consumers not that high. So demand stays robust, continues to advance, and we haven't really solved the supply challenges at this point in time. So that means net net for me, oil prices need to stay at 105 to 125, depending on how much we lose on Russia due to potentially even higher sanctions. When you take a look at the fact that oil markets are still in backwardation, but we're starting to see spreads narrow quite significantly, what does that tell you about the levelling out that we see in the markets in terms of volatility that's expected? Well, there's two things. First of all, clearly, um, with an increase of such magnitude from the strategic reserve, uh, there's less need for prices to really spike. Uh, so if we just lose a million, million and a half from Russia barrels per day, then I think we, we can somehow start to find an equilibrium at, at current levels and volatility in crude uh, could come down a little bit. So I think that's one. But who says that we just lose one to one and a half million barrels from Russia? What if we take lose more and the reorientation from crude supply to Europe into Asia might uh, is, can be still a little bit quite challenging given that increased sanctions are on the table. So I think I wouldn't say that where we are today, that's a, like a, a stable equilibrium at this point in time and the bias is still to the upside. That's why as an investor, some form of exposure to crude oil is highly advised. What about exposure to the Chinese yuan? Because we continue to see the COVID spread across China and the lockdowns. But so far, at least during the pandemic, the yuan has been pretty resilient. Well, yuan had some very strong supporting factors. I mean, we had this fantastic yield carry for the CNY, which completely evaporated, at least in nominal term. In real term, it's still there. So there's one supportive pillar crumbling. Uh, the second, we had a very good growth story. That's obviously not there either. And I think probably also you see on the trade side, things deteriorating a little bit in terms of the very nice surplus that we have seen. So all these pillars going away. And I think that's calls for me that you need to hedge your CNY. We're looking at dollar CNY heading towards 6.4, 6.45. That's not not a massive decline, it's just a gradual uptick, but I still would at this point in time just avoid any CMY long exposure against the dollar. Maybe still in the crosses against the euro, because the euro can still go lower against the, the dollar. So in the crosses, yes, but not against the dollar. And with the weakness of the euro, are we also going to see more dollar strength? Well, I think so. I mean, there's a lot of combinations that historically tends to dollar supportive. So number one, I think real, real, real yields or real yields expectation tips can still move higher given the aggressiveness of the Fed. That's number one. Number two, I think there is going to be a fair bit of growth divergence materializing. I mean, you can argue that everybody's going to slow down into the second half, but who is going to slow down more? And if I look at the commodity shock that Europe is facing, um, I, I think Europe is going to slow down more rapidly. So some of the expectation built in on the ECB seem to me a little bit excessive. So still looking at 108, 105, uh, 1.05 as a lower bound in euro dollar. Tom, let me get your views on the biggest losers and winners. The Aussie dollar, how much further upside is there, given that we're now seeing more expectations for the RBA to get more aggressive? And how much more weakness is there for the yen? Or has that kind of levelled off, given that we had the, the, the verbal jawboning and intervention? No, that has not leveled off. And I think one of the best currencies to be in right now are commodity currencies. I think you really strike the balance here between um, the move in the US, but also the massive terms of trade shifts, the balance and payment improvement. So if you look at the, the data is going to come out on the trade side today, I mean, room to surprise, I would think, to the upside. So this massive improvement in terms of trade, for me, calls a dollar, um, Aussie dollar is probably going towards 0.78 and even the possibility to go to 0.8 at some point. So I think that story still is pretty much in place. And I think we should not forget that, particularly in the case of Australia, while the world is maybe decelerating, 
Australia should accelerate. So you have that growth diverge, and I think investors will pay a little bit more attention to that and bid the currency higher. Mm -hmm. Now, on the weakness side, just to highlight yen, well, I think with BOJ not moving, we're still looking at test of 125, maybe a move above, then right. probably you're going to get politicians a little bit more concerned.